Okay, so uh, thanks again for coming for the last real lecture. So tomorrow, as you know, it will not be the exact lecture format, but more this hands-on session. So today we are going to talk about simulations going beyond dark matter only. Yeah, so the, the last couple of days, we only discussed results and methods and simulation codes um, for dark matter only simulations. Um, and you know, that's, it's usually a good approximation because um, if you take dark energy and dark matter together, it's just by far the largest component in terms of the energy density in the universe. However, if you want to model and understand galaxies in detail and also galaxy evolution, you have to model also the galaxy growth. And that means you have to model these other 5%, you know, which is what, what we call the baryonic physics or baryons, which at the end of the day at early times is just uh, helium and hydrogen, which then, you know, as time goes on, cools, for example, and can form stars, and then it gets enriched through nuclear synthesis, so you get also heavier elements beyond helium. All these elements are summarized in astrophysics as metals, yeah, so everything heavier than helium is actually called a metal. And uh, all this happens due to structure and galaxy formation. Yeah? And so if you want to understand all this, you have to model this baryonic sector. So despite the fact that it's only 5% in the energy density, it's rather complicated to do this modeling because it's rather uncertain because a lot of the physics happens on very small scales, which we can actually not resolve in these simulations. Even if we could resolve it, a lot of the physics is even not yet fully understood. Star formation, there are still a lot of questions about star formation and black hole physics and many other things. Good, so I will try in the next hour to talk a bit about this um, and you know, show you some recent results and what we can do these days with these simulations. And uh, yeah, so this is more to give you a basic idea of what's possible. Yeah. So the, the basic reason why we want to do this is, as I mentioned, we want to understand how galaxies grow and how galaxies evolve. And as you might know, galaxies come in different types and shapes and colors and with different stellar masses. And these are just a few examples here. And at the end of the day, what we want is we want to construct a model, so-called galaxy formation model, that, if you feed it into the computer, produces a virtual universe at the end of the calculation, which agrees with our universe, which produces the same kind of galaxies which literally look exactly like those galaxies, with all the properties, with the masses, with the, you know, with the velocity structure of the stars in these galaxies, with um, even the details like the bars and uh, with spiral structure and uh, the colors. You can also see that they have different colors here. Um, there's also still star formation going on in these galaxies, so we, will also, we also want to recover the star formation rates. So all this should be recovered by the model. And at the center of these galaxies, especially the more massive ones, there's always also a black hole. Yeah, so we also want to describe these properties of the black hole, most importantly their mass. And also there are known scaling relations between the black hole mass and the stellar or bulge mass of the galaxy. So reasonably tight relations. And we also want to recover those. So there's a, a lot of scaling relations actually known from observations and ideally we want to recover all those scaling relations. Yeah, so that's the goal of the model. And the framework, again, this is what I showed already on Monday, is this here. And so far, we, we only looked at the dark matter uh, sector here, how the dark matter actually grows and how structure formation works here. But now we really want to see how these galaxies form, when they form, and how they evolve. Yeah, so this is a, is a more complicated task. Because the dark matter problem, to some degree, is a simple problem because you only have to follow gravity. But now you have to follow all the other physics in addition. Yeah, so that's the challenge. Um, so you can also summarize this so-called galaxy formation problem on this slide here. So what we discussed on Monday is actually with these so-called n-body simulations, we can derive a halo mass function. And that's schematically shown here. So if you take this axis here, this is schematically showing halo mass. And this is showing a number density. So maybe you remember the halo mass function was just number density on the y-axis and on the x-axis, the halo mass. And then you know, schematically, this is now here shown by this orange line, and forget about the dashed line here, what the black line shows is actually the so-called galaxy stellar mass function. It's not the halo mass function, but the galaxy stellar mass function. So as you, as you know, and as we discussed during the week, every galaxy sits within a dark matter halo. So this dark matter halo has a mass, and the galaxy has a stellar mass, which is just the sum of all the stars in the galaxy in terms of the mass. 
And what you can see here is that these two functions, the halo mass function and the galaxy stellar mass function, are not just simple scaled versions of each other. It's not that if you have a halo of a certain mass, <clears throat> that 1% of that would correspond to the stellar mass of the corresponding galaxy or so. That's not, it's not a simple linear scaling or anything like that. But what, instead what you see is that towards lower halo masses and towards higher halo masses, you get a strong suppression or yeah, a strong su suppression of the stellar mass actually. As we get, you see that this curve goes down here significantly towards higher halo masses and towards lower halo masses. And the basic idea what we think what's happening here is that this is a, the process what we call feedback. And um, so the physics behind that is that at this low mass end, you have galaxies which have rather, you know, which are not very massive, the halos, so their potential well is not very deep. So if you have supernova going off in these galaxies, they can efficiently stop star formation in these systems because they can shuffle around the gas a lot. They can also inject a lot of turbulence and a lot of heat in the gas. So you can regulate star formation in these systems through supernova feedback. And so the, through the energy injection of supernova and also momentum injection, and that is what we call this feedback process. And that regulates, that regulates star formation. And it avoids that these galaxies become very massive. And this is why this curve becomes here more flat com compared to, to the halo mass function. Now, in principle, you could say that should also be happening here. But the problem here is that the potential well is much deeper because these halos are much more massive. So the supernova have only a certain amount of energy available. And you have only a certain amount of supernova in total available. So the energy is not sufficient to do much here. So what you need here is a different mechanism. And that's related to the supermassive black holes at the centers of these galaxies. So those accrete. And then, as you know, from E equals mc squared, you can convert this um, you know, through accretion just actually to energy. And then this accretion process also injects a lot of energy at the centers of the galaxies. And this injected energy, which is, can be both thermal and momentum again, can also regulate star formation. So what that means is that at the massive end and at the low mass end, you have a regulation process for star formation. And there's just this sweet spot where both the supernova feedback is not very efficient and the AGN feedback is not very efficient because you, sorry, the black hole feedback is not very efficient because the, the black holes are not very massive, which is just around this mass scale, which is close to 10 to the 12 solar masses, which is around the Milky Way halo mass, where star formation is most efficient. If you go below that or above that, star formation becomes less efficient in, with respect to the halo mass. And so this is what we, what has been, I mean, you know, it took a while to figure this out, and that's just a theory, but it, it seems to describe the data uh, very well. Now, the whole problem of galaxy formation is now, how do you model these feedback processes, and how do you turn the orange curve into the black line? That is what your model has to do. So, or in other terms, how do you take this, which is the dark matter distribution or the backbone of structure formation. And how do you populate this with galaxies in the right way? I mean, this is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope, one of these uh, deep fields. And the question is really, how do you get from, from here to there? Yeah, so this is what we want to try uh, to do. And that's the main challenge. So how do we do this? Well, um, we need a few key ingredients. So there's a, there's a list of things that you have to do to to make that actually work. Um, so first of all, similar to the, well, similar to the dark matter only simulations, you have to, of course, model dark matter and dark energy. But then on top of that, you have to model the baryonic physics. And as I said before, we have at the beginning the baryons mostly in helium and hydrogen as a gas. So you have to solve the gas equations. Uh, so um, specifically, what we do here is we, um, we assume that this is kind of a perfectly inviscid gas. So it has a it's actually treated not with the Navier-Stokes equation, but with the Euler equations. Yeah? So we literally solve the Euler equations for the gas throughout the simulation volume. Yes. In addition to this particle-based uh, calculation for the dark matter that we discussed um, earlier this week. Yeah? But that's not all. It's not sufficient just follow the gas, because at some point this gas will cool and it will form stars if it becomes dense enough. And then you have to include all these other physical processes, and I'll come back to that in a second. So these are processes like the star formation, like stars that age, 
and also undergo nucleosynthesis and become supernova. So you have to model also the supernova. Then at the centers of the galaxies, you have to grow these black holes. So all this has to be modeled, actually, to, to get the right galaxy population. So you, you cannot leave one of those away, because then you will not be able to, to match the observations, actually. Then ideally, you also want to have a very accurate and efficient numerical scheme. I will not talk too much about this, but that's rather important, especially if you want to do very large calculations. Um, you, you want to have very, very accurate and efficient algorithms. And to really study a lot of galaxies, so it's not sufficient to simulate just 10 or 20 galaxies, because the surveys that we have these days, they cover millions of galaxies, so we also want to match the statistics somehow. So ideally, you also want to simulate hundreds of thousands or millions of galaxies in, in one go, essentially. And then at the end of the day, you get a, a, a mock universe, and to really compare them to observations, you also imagine that you put a telescope inside the simulation volume and make mock observations of the galaxies. Uh, and then you can directly compare with observational data and feed the, feed the synthetic data through the same pipelines as what the observers actually use. Yeah. That, that's the basic program. Um, and that approach has been followed a lot over the last decade, or two decades essentially, so a lot of people have followed that program and has been very successful. Now this <clears throat> is an example of one of the more recent simulations from 2014. So what you see here is a is a movie zooming into the into the matter distribution at redshift zero of the simulation. Yeah. So you see here always various things showing up. So this is now showing the gas temperature, and I, I will play this a second time to explain a bit more. Then you see the gas metallicity. So this is the distribution of all the heavy elements, heavier than helium, and then it switches to stellar light. So this is literally the the stars uh, that are simulated. And this is a galaxy which is kind of similar like the Milky Way, a bit more massive and a bit larger, but it's also a spiral galaxy with similar properties. And you see here on the left always the, the scale. Yeah? So you can also see the dynamic range. And, and now it zooms out again. Um, so, what you s so you just saw stellar light. Now what you see is actually the gas density. So this is this thing that we treat with the Euler equations. So the, the gas that's filling the box. And all these things are actually individual galaxies. Yeah? So you, um, you can see there are just many as we zoom out. And now we have a scale here of 3 megaparsec, and we keep zooming out, and at some point um, it now switches to the gas velocity. As you can also see you get pretty high velocities of, you know, in clusters of the order of many hundreds of kilometers per second. And then it will switch back uh, to the dark matter, which is literally the backbone for structure formation. Yeah? Let me just play this one more time so you get the... If I can play it another time... To, yeah, sorry. So, so this is actually taken from a box which is a 100 megaparsec cube, yeah. And then you zoom in on one galaxy here, which has a which has an extent of just a, t a few tens of uh, kpc. And even this individual galaxy is still resolved with a few hundred thousand resolution elements. So it has an enormous dynamic range. These simulations, yeah. So and that that's still kind of well, we can do slightly better than this now. But 2014 or 15, that was the best we could do. Um, and here's again this uh, galaxy. And as I said, this consists of many, many stars. And you can make detailed, you know, for example, kinematic measurements of the stellar velocities here and many other things because it's still extremely well resolved in these simulations. Okay, good. So that is what you can do these days. And to do this, you have to include a couple of things in these models. Yeah, so this is kind of a list of all the things that go into these galaxy formation models. And the first thing you have to do is, since we have to solve the, um, the Euler equations, <coughs> this is a this is a well-studied field. Uh, you know, solving the Euler equations, and there are different methods in doing that. The way how we do it is we use a finite volume scheme. Does anybody know what a finite volume scheme is? So imagine <coughs> you have a PDE and you want to solve this and then there are different ways of doing it. Now if you have the Euler equations, which are a set of uh, partial differential equations, which describe a gas in a certain volume, for example. Now if you want to, um, you know, if, if you want to describe the evolution of that gas, what you can do, for example, is you can discretize your volume in, in little volume, in your simulation volume in little volume elements and then you just trace the mass flux and the momentum flux and all the fluxes from one volume element to another. 
Uh, and then th this allows you then, and then you can essentially write down the whole equations in a, in a discretized way. And that's a typical finite volume scheme because you discretize your volume in terms of your simulation box in terms of volume. Yeah. Another way would be discretizing in mass. That's another way um, which people also use, but we use a finite volume scheme. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's just the first thing you have to have to, to really follow the gas. And then you have to include a couple of uh, physical processes which are listed here. So heating and cooling, that means that you have a gas and this gas is allowed to undergo um, atomic transitions which, al which allows it to cool. Uh, so if you imagine a gas, um, how can it get rid of energy? Well, it can, you can collisionally excite things and then the de-excitation of the energy levels will then radiate radiation away and this is how it can efficiently cool. And this is how the cooling um, works in these simulations. Um, so, and there are different sorts of cooling, so cooling due to helium and hydrogen, but also if you have metals in your simulation, they also contribute to the cooling, so you also have to take this into account. Then there's also radiation in the universe, so you also have to um, describe this somehow. So there are different ways of doing it. Um, so you have to, at minimum, model the average UV radiation field. Uh, so there's a strong UV radiation field from, um, from the galaxies in the universe that you have to model. And then you want to model the, the formation of stars, yeah? because that is what's happening with the gas. As it cools, at some point it forms the stars. And then, as I said, you have to also model the supernova and the, the, the black hole physics. Yeah. So I, I know this is pretty high level, but you know, all, you know, all of this is, is done, essentially, as I mentioned a few times before, in kind of a sub-resolution way, be, because we cannot resolve you know, the physics extremely close to a black hole in, in the simulation. So instead what we do is we have an average description of how a black hole should grow, what kind of mass a black hole should accrete, and how this accreted mass should, you know, sh should feed back energy into the galaxy as it is accreted. So all these are effective models that we have to put in the simulation as a numerical closure, essentially. Yeah, because we don't have the resolution to, to really resolve all that. Are there any questions at that point? Does everybody understand what we are going for? We really try to model all these galaxy formation physical processes to really produce realistic galaxies. Okay. Good. Um, and there are a couple of simulations <coughs> that have done this. Pretty big simulations now. And I just want to show a few of those. So this is, for example, the so so-called Eagle simulation. Um, what you see here is actually the full simulation volume, and I think this is showing the, the gas temperature here, so color-coded. And you also see some numerical parameters here. So this is the box size. It's a it's 100 megaparsec cube. Then you see the particle number. This is two times uh, 1500 cube particles. So it's a it's a two because it's it's 1500 cube for the dark matter and 1500 cube for for the gas. Yeah. So. That's just how, why there's a factor of two here. And this is this epsilon parameter that we discussed before, which is the softening. Yeah? And this simulation was done down to redshift zero. Yeah? So that is, this is typically pretty expensive, but this was done down to redshift zero, which is the, the, final, the final time of the simulation. Another simulation which is much larger is this uh, blue tide simulation. Um, this is, has a much larger volume. Yeah? So this has already nearly 600 megaparsec cube. There's also many more particles. This has two times 7,000 cube particles. Um, but it was only run to redshift 8. Yeah, so this is specifically interesting for high redshift studies. OK, and then there's yet another one, just to give you an idea. So this is called Horizon AGN. It's also from 2014 and 16, actually. And again, you see here the, the, the box, more or less, and here are the numerical parameters. So it's, it's a bit smaller than the other two. Um, but you also get a lot of galaxies in, in these kind of simulations. Okay, so let me... And this is the, the one that we have been working on, um, which was actually the first that came out, 2014, uh, which where you can also see the, the numerical parameters here. And here in this, here in this image, on this um, demo image, uh, you can actually see what you can do with these simulations. Yeah? So you see here... For example, in the background, the bluish stuff here, that's the dark matter distribution predicted by the simulation. Then the lower half, 
we show the gas density. Then here we show the, the, the temperature map of the gas for the full volume, the gas entropy, the gas velocity. And then you can also look at individual galax galaxies. So this is just two randomly picked galaxies or two picked galaxies from the simulation volume. And you can also make annihilation predictions. So actually this circle here is a zoom in onto this massive cluster and it's showing literally the, the annihilation signal of the, of the galaxy. Yeah, so you can make a, a lot of things. Also X-ray um, predictions and, and many other things. So this is why these simulations are so useful because you can predict um, a ton of things. So in fact, there's also a lot of people now working with these simulations to make LIGO predictions. Um, or LISA predictions, you know, th there's a lot of things you can you can really do with them. Okay, so what do you get out of these simulations? Well, you get a lot of galaxies, because this is what you want. And this is shown here. These are all simulated galaxies. On the left, you see so-called, you know, as you know, disk galaxies, which are blue and star forming. And the right, you see this different type of galaxies, which are elliptical galaxies, which are typically reddish. You see that they are a bit more reddish. And uh, they are so-called, um, sometimes called dead, because they have no star formation going on anymore. Yeah, so um, th those are still having active star, star formation. Uh, those don't. Yeah, this, is, this is a basic distinction between galaxy types in the universe that you have this split between elliptical galaxies and these disk galaxies. OK, and also the other simulations got uh, various types of galaxies. So this is examples from the Eagle simulation. This is from Horizon. And this is again from Illustrious. Yeah, so all these simulations got very successful in producing all kind of um, realistic looking galaxies. Now you then want to test this a bit more quantitatively, whether this really agrees with the data. And this is then really where all these scaling relations and everything comes in. And that's kind of uh, summarized in this plot here. So what this plot actually shows you is as a function of stellar mass, which is shown here on the x-axis, it shows the fraction of different galaxy types. Yeah, and um, it's shown here in blue and red. So the blue are so-called late-type galaxies. So these are galaxies similar to the Milky Way. And then there are these early-type galaxies, which are galaxies which more like, like, look like uh, these elliptical galaxies. Yeah? And what is observed or, or measured observationally are the, uh, is shown in these points here. Yeah? So these are just some observations. And you can see there's a trend, namely that as a function of stellar mass, the fraction of early types goes up and the fraction of late type galaxies goes down. Yeah. And a, challenge, uh, a big challenge for these simulations has been for a long time actually whether this trend can be reproduced in the simulations. And you can see the solid line here is the simulation prediction, um, you know, solid blue and solid red. And you can see that it, you know, there's no perfect agreement with the data, but it shows the right trend. And this was the major thing of these simulations back in 2014 that was possible to, to recover essentially that trend, um, which was not possible before. Um, yeah, let me maybe skip this. This is not too exciting. Yeah. Another thing you can do, and this is shown here, this is, um, these are images, mock images of the Hubble Space Telescope. So what you see here is, um, the right is actually a mock image, and the left is a real Hubble Space Telescope image. Yeah, so it's one of these deep fields where you have the Hubble Space Telescope pointing at a very dark spot on the sky and just a very long exposure. And you can do this with a real Hubble Space Telescope, and you get this. And this is a pretty famous picture. And you can do the same in the simulation and get that. And what you then can do, you can run a statistical analysis of the sizes of galaxies, the colors, and so on and so forth in that image, and in that image, and convince yourself that this agrees reasonably well. So what that means is not, that not only the galaxy at a certain redshift, or the galaxy population at a certain redshift looks like the observed one, but also if you integrate this over multiple redshifts, you actually get the right um, population mix. Uh, so this, a lot of people now make these kind of mock observations, as I mentioned before, to compare also better to observational data. Any questions so far? I know this is very far away from your uh, comfort zone, maybe, but um, this is what most people actually do. So none of us is really running dark matter only simulations anymore these days. Yeah. I mean, this is not what I do, but does the simulation take into account all the weird optical stuff like gravitational lensing and, and all the other stuff that makes it hard for us to actually take a picture from Earth? 
Um, yeah, there are people who, when they do, when they make the mock images, they also do gravitational lensing. Yeah, they, they, they have ray tracing algorithms to do the, the lensing on, also in the, yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> the real way to quantify this is actually to look at each redshift in the simulation and construct the galaxy stellar mass function and compare that galaxy stellar mass function to what we measure. We can measure the galaxy stellar mass function to pretty high redshift these days, and this will even get better with new telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope, which will go far beyond what actually Hubble can do. And that's the way how we compare. So we construct at every redshift where the simulation makes output, we construct the galaxy stellar mass function and we compare that to what the telescopes actually measure to, to see whether the galaxy density at a given mass agrees between the two. Any other questions? Who has ever seen any of these hydrodynamic simulations before? Okay, so some, sorry? No, no, just generally heard of them. So, okay, so there are some people. Now it's, I mean, in the field of galaxy evolution, most of us actually spend most of the time on that. It's, it's a very small fraction of people who still do only dark matter only. Um, and I, I will show in a few seconds or a few minutes why, why it's actually not such a good thing, uh, thing to do dark matter only because it has some limitations. Okay, so now um, just want to spend another maybe 15 or 20 minutes on this on our newest uh, project, which is called Illustrious TNG for lack of a better name. So this is essentially the follow-up of the uh, Illustrious simulation, which was one of the simulations I showed before, um, which was this 100 megaparsec volume, uh, which, which where we were able to, to get the galaxy fractions and the types uh, right as a function of stellar mass, as I showed. So this is a follow-up of that simulation, and it's actually not one simulation, it's three simulations in total. So this is what you see here. It's three simulation volumes. It's called this TNG 300, 150. Um, I don't, yeah. So the, the mass resolution is not always the same in these simulations. So this has a very good mass, re mass resolution. This has a somewhat poorer mass resolution, which is simply a fact of the, of the simulation volume. So you see that this is a, a 300 megaparsec box. This is just, this is a 100 megaparsec box and this is a 50 megaparsec box. And so these two simulations are already finished. This TNG50 is still running. And that will be a simulation which costs in total of the order of, I don't know, I think 120 or 130 million CPU hours. So that's pretty expensive. So the whole project is, is 250 million CPU hours, which is, it's kind of expensive. So it's not a very cheap one. Um, but you get a lot out of it because you can do a lot of physics of very massive clusters here. And you can do a lot of, can look in the, the formation of smaller um, halos here. So you can have essentially a very large dynamic range if you combine all the simulations. Yeah. So that's, that's the nice thing about this, um, about this set of simulations. And if you are, here are some numbers if you're interested in, in the actual numbers. So this is a table similar to what I showed on Monday, um, where it's shown the, the, the box size and the, the number of resolution elements here. And you can see that this TNG 300 this has now um, 2,500 cube resolution elements, which is, you know, which is currently the largest, if I'm not wrong, the largest hydro simulation run to redshift zero. Yeah. So it's, um, it's, it's pretty expensive also uh, to run this down to redshift zero. And then you say, see here also um, the baryonic mass resolution, and you see again this epsilon here, which is this softening parameter that we discussed before. Yeah, so this is what we have at the moment. And the simulation has, an, has another feature which is shown in this movie. So this movie is again, is taken from one of these recent uh, Illustrious TNG simulations. And what you see is the gas again here. And it's again a time evolution. Yeah, so the redshift is running here. And uh, it's just a small subset of the simulation. It's not the full volume. It's only a 10 megaparsec sub-volume. But um, what you see here is actually color-coded is not the gas density or the gas metallicity, 
but in fact is the, is the magnetic field that's frozen into the gas. So this simulation also is actually also the first of its kind that self-consistently traces on these large scales the magnetic fields. So I don't know how much you know about magnetic fields in the universe, but there are the you know, galaxies. That you can actually measure the magnetic fields in galaxies and also galaxy clusters. So there's a non-negligible magnetic field, and this can be traced now here. So for example, the white regions, these are of the order of um, 10 microgauss or so, field strength. Yeah. Um, so these are the 10 to 100 microgauss. So these are the largest fields we have in the simulation. And that's also in reasonable agreement with, the, with observational um, measurements. Okay, so that's kind of unique um, because there's no other simulation that can do this self-consistently at the moment. Okay, good. So let me then maybe for are there any questions before before I come to some results? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They follow. Yes, that's true. I mean the. <coughs> excuse me. Essentially, how the magnetic fields are treated here. For the, for the experts here, it's kind of an ideal MHD, uh, ideal magnetohydrodynamics uh, approximation, which means that magnetic fields are frozen into the, into the gas, essentially. So that's a very good approximation for most of the plasmas that you have here. And this is why it also traces kind of nicely the, the filamentary structure here. Yeah. It gets amplified through shearing and dynamo effects here at the centers. And this is how the amplification actually works. Okay, good. Any other questions? Is everybody still following? Okay, good. So once you have such a simulation, um, you want to make some first tests, and the first, whether it's you know how reasonable the results are and how good it decreases with observational data. The first test you can make is to look at the clustering of galaxies. So imagine you have a huge volume, you have tens or hundreds of thousands of galaxies, and you have surveys with millions of galaxies. The, the most basic thing you can do is just looking at the clustering signal, specifically, for example, at the two-point correlation function. Yeah. So that is the first thing you can do, and this is actually shown here. So in these six panels, the two-point correlation function is shown um, in different stellar mass bins. And so the M star here is always the stellar mass of a galaxy. You see here these six panels that show this. And then you see in each panel a red line, which is the simulation prediction. And then the black points, these are actually measurements from observations. And the main takeaway here is, although this line, this line doesn't go perfectly through the data, and by the way, the data has here no error bus because there's really an enormous amount of data available now. As I said, these are huge surveys which covers many millions of galaxies. So you can see that the line mostly goes through the data. There are, of course, regions where there's disagreement. Um, but on average, this looks actually pretty good. So and especially if you would compare this to earlier simulations, it looks much better than any previous uh, hydro simulation. Yeah. So that's kind of a first test, which tells you that your galaxies are distributed kind of in the right way in this virtual universe. Yeah. So that's um, a very first, a very important first test that you have to make. Then you can go to a kind of higher order things that you want to test. And the next thing is that even if you have the clustering right, then galaxies come in different colors also, not only in different stellar masses, but also in different colors. Um, yeah, so the color of a galaxy is simply the superposition of the color of all the stars. Yeah, you, you know the sun is, of course, is yellow, there are stars of different spectral types, and the, the color of a galaxy is simply the sum of all the colors of the, the stars, essentially. And there's also a lot of observations or, or observational data available there. And so the question is, can you then recover these observational trends of colors um, with these simulations? And this is shown in, this six, in these six panels. Um, so what you see here in the black, the black line are observational results. And this G minus R, this is just a way how to measure colors. Does anybody know what that is, G minus R? No one heard about that. Yeah, or you could guess what it is. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's, it's essentially, 
the G are these are just certain band filters. You you know you have a you have a spectrum and you have certain filters or band path filters that you put on the spectrum. And so this so-called SDSS survey had a had a bunch of filters and one is called G band R band and yeah they it's just some names. And if you take the difference here, then it's a, it's a color index essentially, which um, relates to the color. It's not important for the point I want to make. It's just that you see the, the black line here. You see, you see these two peaks, and as you increase in stellar mass, so this is again shown in stellar mass spins. You see that the second peak becomes always more pronounced, up to the point where everything is here in this one pronounced peak. So what that means is that if you go from low mass galaxies to high mass galaxies, they typically go from blue to red. You, know, you have here a significant blue population, and here you have a very significant red population. Can anybody, that's a difficult question, can anybody see why, what's the physics behind that? Why do they become, just in vague terms, why do they become redder if they become more massive? Yeah, that's one one part of the reason. Yeah, uh, one one part of sorry. Yeah, it's also that in these bigger galaxies you have more massive black holes, and then the feedback from these black holes is stronger, and then it suppresses star formation more efficiently, and then you don't get new star formation. And the only way to keep a galaxy blue is if you have ongoing star formation, because as you know, as stars age, they become redder, right? And the young stars are typically the, the blue ones. So. This is why this whole thing shifts from blue to red. So this is observationally extremely well-established result. So the question is, can the simulation recover this? And then if you look at this blue line here, you can see that again, quantitatively, there's no perfect agreement, but qualitatively, you get this, this trend uh, quite nicely uh, recovered. Yeah. I should also say, this is not particle physics. You know, we are not after 0.001% or what, this is just extremely difficult to do. You know, if we have something with an effect of two, it's already kind of good. So that is also currently, currently the best we can do in terms of reproducing the, the color distribution of galaxies with these simulations. <clears throat> good. Now, now the, the, the question is, of course, I mentioned before that no one is doing these dark matter only or I shouldn't say it like this, but uh, only a few people are doing dark matter only simulations uh, these days. And the reason for that is, is not only that, um, or the reason why that's not a good idea in general is that these, hi these hydro simulations, they also tell us that all these effects that are going on in the baryons, they have an effect also on the total dark matter and the dark matter distribution. So for example, if you imagine that uh, a black hole accretes mass and then injects a lot of energy, due to the accretion, then this will somehow move around, uh, if it's momentum, for example, it will move around the, the matter at the center of the galaxy, and it will also, through gravity, track along the, the, the dark matter to some degree. So uh, the same is true for supernova feedback. So what that means is that if you have these baryonic physics processes included in the simulation, then the dark matter distribution will be different from a simulation where you, would not have, where you don't have this galaxy formation included. Yeah, does this make sense? It's just a, there's a back reaction between these bionic physics and the dark matter going on. And that's shown here on this slide. So if you just focus here on the upper left then, so for, forget the other three here for the moment. So what you see here is, um, is actually matter power spectrum, or ratio of matter power spectra. And so you have the K on the x-axis, and then you have a P of K FP divided by P of K DM. So that means P of K of the so-called full physics simulation, which includes all the galaxy formation physics, and DM only is a dark matter only, sim the, the, the corresponding dark matter only simulation, which has no, no galaxy formation physics. Now in an ideal world where the baryonic physics or the galaxy formation physics does not affect the dark matter and does not affect the matter distribution, this ratio should always be one. So the logarithm should always be zero, so should, this should always be on, on this line here. However, if you look at the plot, where, where there are a couple of different simulations shown, you can see that there are severe deviations imprinted. And this is exactly coming from these uh, galaxy formation physics. And this is one of the reasons why dark matter-only simulations 
are not always fully reliable depending on what you are looking at. Yeah? So it, it strongly depends on the question. Of course, there are, there are regimes where they are fully reliable, but if you are in that regime, then you always have to worry about this baryonic feedback or, yeah, because it changes the matter distribution. And this has also direct implications because, you know, if you take, for example, weak lensing service that try to constrain cosmology, then this is a regime that is affected um, by, or can be affected by these baryonic uh, physics effects. So this is a bit, um, you know, it's then critical because it affects cosmological estimates. Does everybody know what I mean, what I'm talking about? It's just a, a back reaction, essentially, of the galaxy formation physics. Yep. So, earlier this week, we saw that there were some problems on small scales, the discrepancy between the simulation and the Um, yeah, I cannot put a probability on it, but it's, I, I, there are models around that solve the small scale problems through these uh, baryonic effects. So I, I think, yeah, it's, it's definitely possible that you can solve all these outstanding small scale issues by combining CDM with the, with the galaxy formation physics, because it can kind of shuffle around the matter quite significantly in, in the, also in these regimes where, where there are the problems. Yeah. I, I agree. That's, I mean, this is the thing, right? So it's, it's you know, the, these problems occur on scales where, unfortunately, baryonic physics is most likely playing a big role. So it's not very pristine to test whether it's now an alternative dark matter model or whether it's just, um, whether it's just baryonic physics. So it's, to disentangle those two alternatives, is, it's not so simple. Well, for, the, for, this, for this issue that we discussed um, at the beginning of the week where we sa talked about this course uh, in, um, in lower mass halos, their supernova feedback is a very prominent process. And people have demonstrated for certain implementations of star formation and supernova feedback that they can create these cores without doing you know, warm dark matter or self inducting dark matter or anything else. Yeah. They can create the same cores, essentially, just by having very efficient supernova feedback going on. The only issue with that is then, you know, this is, there are also other models that produce the same kind of galaxies with, which don't lead to that core formation. So then it's, it becomes a bit inconclusive, right? Because you have two models which produce more or less the same galaxies. One model predicts that the dark matter should form a core, the dark matter halo should have a core, and the other model predicts it should not have a core. So. But the structure of the galaxy in terms of the stellar mass and the stellar properties, it looked more or less the same. So that, that is what I mean. Well, the difference are in the details how star formation and supernova feedback are implemented. Be because as I mentioned, it, we cannot implement this from first principle. So what you always do is you see a certain portion of the gas with certain properties, and then you say, OK, this gas should undergo star formation now. But what are these properties, and what is the rate of star formation, and how do you put this all together? It's up to the, up to the person who actually develops the model, right? So there's no golden rule how to do this. There's a lot of, people have a lot of experience in doing that, and there's some agreement what you have to do, but there's, you know, there's still some variety in these implementations. Yeah. And that's a bit of a problem with these baryonic solutions, because even if you create the cores, with a baryonic solution, there might always be another baryonic solution which does, does not create the core. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So we only showed some simulations on these parts. What about the real data? So which simulations more, more consistent with the data? Um, well, th this is kind of, I think this is inconsistent here. Yeah, this was a, so the, the more realistic predictions are those. And so the blue is a two extreme case, essentially. Yeah, but 
but this is all for simulation. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I don't, yeah, I would need to check, but, but this is also observationally, I think you can, yeah, this is kind of uh, ruled out, the observationally also, this strong signal, that it suppresses so much. I don't know where the data exactly lies, but that's uh, as far as I remember, at least. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. <coughs> Good. And then um, maybe I spend another five or ten minutes on on the rest of the simulation, and um, uh, then I will make a few recap comments on the hands-on session again. So if you have questions, we can briefly discuss them um, today in the last ten minutes or so. So what you see here is uh, another prediction from the simulation, which is actually the magnetic fields in galaxies, which is again, as I mentioned before, which is a quite nice unique feature here. So you see here um, three different galaxies on the left, one, two, three, um, just in different projections from which direction you look at them. And then you see here uh, the velocity and also the, the magnetic field and also the topology. So the arrows should show actually the uh, the direction of the field lines. So on the left, this is all shown for elliptical galaxy. On the right, this is shown for a spiral galaxy. And can, you can see this nicely ordered magnetic fields here on, in, in the spiral galaxies. Um, and you, you know, you can actually, we haven't done this yet, but you can you know, try to quantify what happens, for example, if you have um, the, the merging going on of two of these galaxies, how does the topology change, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of things that uh, can potentially be done by, by looking at the magnetic fields in, in more detail. And again, if you check the field strength in these simulations, it's also in pretty good agreement um, with, for example, Milky Way measurements of the magnetic field or uh, also from clusters. Okay, and then one of the last things I want to show is, um, does anybody know anything about radio emission from galaxy clusters? Yeah, there's a lot of things you can do with these simulations. It's uh, just so. How can you create radio uh, emission in a in a in a uh, in a hot plasma? Uh, no, it's much simpler. It's, it's a very simple process. So, what's the simplest process that you can generate? Yeah, synchrotron, right? So, how does that work? Synchrotron emission. Yeah, you need a ma essentially you have charged particles and then you have a magnetic field and this is how it works here. So since we have magnetic fields here, so we can actually make predictions of the synchrotron emission and that's measurable as radio emission. Yeah, and this, there's a lot of observatories planned and ongoing. Um, some are shown here, like SKA, LOFAR, VLA, and so on and so forth, which are very powerful to observe actually the, the radio emission from um, from massive uh, halo or galaxy clusters, and this is. These are just mock, mock observations of taken from the simulation for four of these instruments. So what you see here in the background, the color coding is actually the, the X-ray emission because the plasma also emits an X-ray. And then on top of this, you get this synchrotron emission where we show just the sigma contours here. And the nice thing then is that you can then correlate the, um, the X-ray emission with the radio emission and there are well-established scaling relations there, so this is shown here in gray, and you can compare this in blue, which is the simulation data, compared to the simulation data, and you essentially uh, recover here the right trend. And you have to, you know, to appreciate this fully is, you know, there's so much physics going into these simulations, it's kind of amazing that, you know, at the end of millions of time steps, or so you get something which looks so close to the uh, observed scaling relations, you know. This um, sometimes is, is rather surprising, actually, because you know, there's so many physical processes going on that it's, it's really amazing that this, that this works out. Okay, so I'll stop here because um, we can talk more about the hands-on, but are there any questions? I know this was very far away from your usual stuff, but I, I feel it's important that you see this because otherwise you walk away and think all of us are doing only dark matter, only simulations, which is clearly not the case. So there's, f there's far more going on beyond the stuck matter only stuff, yeah. So, and this is, I mean, I only scratched the surface, but this, this is really what most of us are doing. Any questions? Yep. Since you mentioned radio signal, so how about 
Um, yeah, so I haven't, I mean, I haven't worked much on 21 centimeter, but yes, you can, because we, we have neutral hydrogen also in the simulation, so you can make 21 centimeter predictions. And pe people are doing this more now with all these 21 centimeter missions coming up. Um, and in fact, if you go to the archive, there are some papers based on this simulation that look into the, uh, that make 21 centimeter predictions based on that simulation. Yeah, you can do it because there's the, the hydrogen is in the simulation. You just, yeah, that, that's possible, yeah. Any other questions? I mean, I, as I said, I didn't talk about every detail. For example, there's also, there's also models for Newton star, Newton star mergers in these simulations. You can make R process predictions and gravitation wave predictions and many other things. But so if you really want, you should read the papers. There's a lot of details in the papers, actually. So. But the main caveat, and that is the main thing you should not forget, all these simulations rely a lot on sub-resolution models. So um, the physics on these very small scales is all put in based on sub-resolution models. And so we, because we lack the resolution and also the knowledge how the, how the physics exactly works on these very small scales. It's, it's different from, you know, if, you know, if you do very detailed QFT simulations and you want to simulate a single proton. So it's, it's quite the opposite approach what we do, right? We come from the large scales and we, we, go, we, we push for smaller and smaller scales, but at some point we need a numerical closure, which is this sub-resolution model. Yep. Uh, say again, sorry, I didn't. What do you mean that non? Non gravity, just like say any non trivial scattering, dark matter, barium. No, in these simulations, typically we assume that the only interaction between dark matter and barium is gravity, right? So there's no other interaction yeah, there. So, well, it depends what you turn on and how strong it is. So I don't. Yeah. So you have anything in mind? <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, there is now. I don't know whether how much you have followed this, but there's this. There's this 21 centimeter signal where people have think now that there should be some interaction going on between baryons and dark matter at redshift 10 or 15 or you know, at very high redshift. That, I don't know how much that would change things. I mean, I, haven't, I don't have much experience. And people have, have not explored this too much to look into baryon dark matter interactions beyond gravity. Any other questions? No more questions? OK. Good, then let's maybe use the other 50 minutes for questions and issues with the, with the hands-on, um, so that we uh, let's see. <clears throat> so who has tried at all to do something? Oh, there's already a few people. That's good. So who succeeded? And who failed? In, uh, no, I, I, I'm only talking about the compiling. That's the compiling. <laughs> so who failed with the compiling? Who, who, yeah, who, who did not get the executable at the end of the day, which means running make, and it didn't work. So, who, so you all could, OK. Not. Not. Who, who, one. So what, was the, what is the issue? Uh-huh. So, so in your case, what was the issue? I think also was some kind of uh, software had not been. Okay. So it should actually really only fail if some package is actually missing. Yeah. So, but did anybody have issues with the MPI? Or did uh, so the enable MPI for the fast Fourier transform, is that necessary? Um, if, you, if you install the FFTW or... Yeah. Yeah, 
yeah, then you should, yeah, then it's usually required, yeah. So, okay, so we had HDF5 issue. What were any other issues with packages that did not work? So all the others that tried it got the executable and could run make and everything. Okay, and then did you make some other, did you play it with it or you just compile it and that's... Mm -hmm. Permission error. That's weird. Um, so, but you can change the permissions yourself, right? With change mod or so. Like, okay, so that sh that shouldn't be too bad of a problem. Um, okay, so let me maybe. Okay, as I said, I, I cannot help too much with the individual packages if some software package is not working. I mean, if it really doesn't work at all, then we can sit together tomorrow a bit more. Um, however, what I thought, I think it would really be good if, if tomorrow, you know, there is this, in, we have this simple plot map code here, which is really a trivial thing to do, essentially, just reading in the data and making the map that I showed. So it would really be interesting if, if those of you who have the code installed and managed to, or maybe who managed to do it today or whatever, if some of you could really think about this friends of friends thing to identify halos in the simulation, so that would be very nice. If, does, does anybody have experience with clustering algorithms or you have a bit of experience? Okay. So. Uh, if you have nothing better to do this afternoon or tomorrow morning or tonight, um, if, if some of you really want to sit together and try to code up a, a structure finding algorithm with the goal of finding really the halos in the simulation. Yeah. So what we want is you have, the, you have all the particles in the simulation box, but they are unstructured. It's just the positions and the velocities. What we want is ideally a list um, of halos, which tell us, okay, these particles with these IDs, so all the particles also have IDs in these snapshots, they belong to a given halo. And then we can plot individual halos, and we can also make density profiles of individual halos. And one easy, or one reasonably easy way to do it is really using a friends of friend algorithm. So if, if some of you feel to do something more challenging, then, yeah, sh you should give this a try. I don't have an example code here for that, so I... Yeah, and, and it's also not required that all of you do this, but if you feel that you want to do something which goes beyond just plotting the data and looking a bit at the redshift evolution, um, that, that would be something um, interesting. Does everybody know what I'm talking about with structure finding and so on? Yeah. Okay. And then for the very ambitious, uh, ambitious people, once you have the structure finding and once you have the halo, you should make a density profile of that, and then you should fit this for the most massive halo in the simulation volume. Ideally, you should get an FW profile. Or you should at least see that it's reasonably well described by an FW profile. Yeah. If you feel like doing this. This is not, you know, no one is forced to do anything, but that would be, uh, I feel, a good learning experience. Yeah. And, um, just so before we conclude for today, so that we just let me make a few more comments about this plot map script that I just opened here. You know, there's a, because I didn't have time yesterday to talk much about it. So, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of uh, Python modules here uh, imported. And the only, uh, well, the main important one is this read snap uh, one. This is actually the, the driver to, reach this, uh, to read the snapshot files. And you see that it's actually pretty easy then to read various blocks from the from the file like the position you have a tag here pos you can read the mass 
And similarly, you could also read the velocity, for example. You would just replace the POS with a VEL, um, and that, that would give you the velocity. And if you really want to do a structure finding algorithm, you ha just have to take this NumPy array and feed it into your structure finder. Yeah, in the friends of friends of or whatever, whatever structure finder you want to use. Yeah, so that's the that's the basic idea. Um, yeah, and the rest is literally just plotting. Did anybody run this already or try anything with that? Or, or run the simulation and then run it on a, you tried this or? Yeah, it worked. I had to, uh, you know, my table situation first. Ah. I had to revert to like a 30.4. Okay, yeah, so there's, yeah, the, the whole thing relies on pi tables, which is the, inter, the, the binding to HDF5 and Python, yeah. Yeah, that is probably, I'm, I'm too old for that. I'm still Python 2.7, so that's, so it doesn't work with Python 3 at all, or? Okay. So who's using Python 3? 3, 3, 3, 3. Okay, and who, who is the, who's using Python 2? Who's not using Python? <laughs> so, so what, okay. Good. I mean, uh, yeah, it, this was all written for Python 2, essentially. Yeah, so, but I don't know if you have an Anaconda environment or so, you can just create a new environment. It's, it's not so much work. But, um, um, well, even that would not work in Python 3, right? The print um, like this will cause problems. So, okay. So, yeah, it will only, it sh should run smoothly with Python 2. I forgot to mention that yesterday. Okay, so what I suggest for tomorrow is I will give a more formal presentation, 10, 15 minutes tomorrow, how, how, how to set all this up and give a bit more background. And then it will probably be 45 minutes just open working and everybody can talk to everybody and just see how far we got. You know, I, I think everybody should be able to create these maps, at least if you're interested in creating these maps. We might be also be able to make a movie out of these maps and then... Um, if some of you are really keen to start tonight on some structure finding, then we, we see whether somebody gets something until tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, any last questions for today? No? Ah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's actually, if you Google friends of friends, cosmological simulations, that will pop out probably, uh, you know, that you will find a couple of papers that tell you how the friends of friends algorithm is typically applied. And it, it has to, because a friends of friends has only one input, which is a kind of a linking length. And there's an ideal value for the linking length, which is, um, which is specified in these papers that you will immediately find by Googling it. But it's, it's yeah. It, actually, when you implement the algorithm, just keep the linking length free. I can tell you what linking length you should use, but keep this parameter free parameter in your algorithm. Yeah. I mean, that's the only, parameter of the algorithm, essentially. Okay, anything else? Okay, good. Then, thanks again, and uh, see you tomorrow then, yeah? Okay, bye.